He graduated from college. He was an educated man. How could he do such a stupid thing? When we heard about it, we didn't really believe it. And it wasn't like him at all. Is he guilty? Sure he's guilty. But knowing his best side, it's so hard to believe. When it became clear that the girls hadn't returned next day, it became probable that some kind of crime had occurred. We imagined all sorts of things, but not the very worst. There was still hope. We tried to imagine every possible situation, but I don't think we thought the worst. We just didn't want to think the worst. Katerina Martinova was born and raised in Ryazan. It was a small city located near the Oka River in the western part of Russia. Ekaterina was lovingly nicknamed Katya by her friends and family. She was an ordinary woman from a typical Russian family and grew up playing with dolls with her older sister Anya. Katya's mother, Irina, worked as a saleswoman at a store, and her father worked at a factory. Katya grew up in a happy and prosperous family without experiencing any significant problems. Unfortunately, this made her a bit naive to the horrors of the world. When she was in the ninth grade, she wanted to grow up quickly and experience the world despite not having gone anywhere outside her small city. This was why Katya was excited when she and her sister Anya heard about the big festival in Ryazan. Their city was no longer a communist city, so there was to be a big celebration of the Orthodox religious festival of faith, hope, and love. The open-air street party and disco appealed to them, especially to Katya. It would be the year's biggest event, and Katya's first ever disco experience, so the Martinova sisters wouldn't miss it for the world. I am Katya's sister. There was a street party and disco in the town, and I was supposed to go with Katya. But I went without her on my own, and so I asked a girlfriend of mine called Lena if she would take her. Elena Samokina was a close friend of Katya's older sister. They were schoolmates at the Ryazan Professional Technical Institute. When Anya told Elena about her sister's situation, she phoned Katya immediately, and they got to talking. They were three years apart, but still got along well, so they agreed to go to the disco together. On September 30th, 2000, Elena picked up Katya, and together they rode the bus and attended the event in their city. Katya's first disco experience was a blast. She thoroughly enjoyed the holiday under Elena's care. It was around 10 p.m. when the pair decided to go home. Because of the holiday street party, countless crowds were around, and most of them were trying to board the limited number of buses at the time. The fun that Katya and Elena had felt moments before evaporated, and they were soon stressed out and worried if they would ever be able to ride a bus before midnight. While waiting for another bus, the worried pair were standing on the side of the road when a car stopped in front of them. They were surprised because they weren't trying to hitch a ride. The middle-aged man behind the wheel offered to give them a lift, pointing out that it was already too late to wait for the bus. Katya looked at the driver and thought there was nothing suspicious about him. He seemed like a typical good Samaritan who just wanted to help them out. She was still unsure of what to do, but when the older Elena opted to get in the car, Katya trusted her friend and went along. They both got inside the car and they gave the man their address. In Russia, strangers offering rides was quite a regular occurrence. There was a time when car owners felt obliged to provide such services to strangers needing a ride. This was why Elena was confident about placing herself and Katya in such a situation. In her mind, she was perfectly safe. Unfortunately, getting in that car would turn out to be the start of a horrific nightmare that would change their lives. The quiet, middle-aged driver introduced himself as Viktor Mokov, and the man in the passenger seat was Lyosha. While driving, they first stopped at a store to buy chocolates. The two men seemed friendly and joked around with them, so Katya and Elena were comfortable in the back seat. After the store, the driver offered them some alcoholic drinks to celebrate the event. Alarm bells flashed before Elena's eyes, but she didn't want to anger the driver. She just wanted to go home, so she drank what was offered. Katya, on the other hand, had no experience with alcohol, but she wanted to seem mature to her friend. She wanted to be like Elena, so she also drank what the driver offered. Soon, Elena felt like there was something wrong. She lost her sense of time and place and felt like they were driving for a long time. She went in and out of consciousness, and her body felt heavy. She knew that it wasn't just alcohol in that drink. It was laced with something else. They should have been home in just half an hour, but because they were under the influence of strong chemicals in their system, 
they didn't notice that the driver took them 56 miles away. As the car entered a private road, Elena feared for her and Katya's safety. Unfortunately, she was too weak to fight the effects of the chemicals. She felt like something dreadful was coming her way, and she was powerless to stop it. When the car stopped, Mokov called Elena out of the vehicle. With her friend away, Katya was terrified and didn't know what was happening or where she was. Above all, it was Katya's first time to experience the effects of the substances inside her body, and it was not as fun as she had heard. She slowly told her friend that the stranger had brought them there to use them. Katya couldn't believe what she was hearing. She had no experience being with a man and didn't know if her friend was joking or not. Unfortunately, it wasn't a cruel joke. Mokov came back and took her to the garage and did just what her friend said. Afterward, he forced her to descend the ladder into the underground bunker beneath the garage. She was locked inside a small room with a double-decker bed at the far wall. Katya was left alone and crying. Then, the man used Elena as he had done to Katya earlier. It was an awful experience for her. To get through the horrific ordeal, Elena convinced herself that the man would let them go after that night. When the man was satisfied with Elena, he told her to go to the bunker and fetch Katya. Thinking they were being released, Elena did as she was told. Unfortunately, when she went down to fetch her friend, the man locked them in. The next day, the families of both Katya and Elena were worried that something had gone wrong. It was Sunday morning, and the two hadn't come back. Irina, Katya's mother, was beside herself, thinking what could have happened to her daughter. She immediately went to the police to report them missing. We imagined all sorts of things, but not the very worst. There was still hope. We tried to imagine every possible situation, but I don't think we thought the worst. We just didn't want to think the worst. Senior Prosecutor Dmitry Plotkin feared for the worst. In his experience, predators tend to end the lives of their victims. When it became clear that the girls hadn't returned next day, it became probable that some kind of crime had occurred. But we had to establish what kind of crime it was exactly. Unfortunately, the stories the police told Katya's family worsened their fears. It was a fatalistic approach that could have been handled more delicately. What seemed like an opportunity to keep hope alive for the family became a forceful intervention of acceptance that the two women were most likely lost for good. The police told us all sorts of awful stories. They said that in 99% of all cases like this, the children never come home alive. They said it wasn't worth our going to anyone for help. They said it was hopeless, really. For the families of Katya and Elena, the hell of not knowing what happened to their loved ones would continue. Without any solid lead or clue, the case soon stalled, and the investigation met dead ends. The case turned cold, and days morphed into weeks, months, and years. Meanwhile, time inside the bunker went by slowly. For Katya and Elena, it seemed like their nightmare never ended. The man used them almost daily. He would call out to them individually, take them into another small room inside the bunker, and get his way with them until he was satisfied. During their first days of captivity, Katya and Elena tried to resist. They refused to submit to Mokov's will, but he would punish them into submission. He would turn off their lights, threaten to shut down their ventilation, starve them, and even whip them with a rubber hose. Soon, the two women were too weak to resist. On the days they were cooperative, he would feed them and treat them well. They were slowly trained in this reward and punishment system, and ultimately became the perfect objects for the captor. At first, Katya and Elena tried tracking their time inside the bunker. They'd scratched the dates on the wall as days went by, but they lost hope and stopped tracking their time within their two-by-three-meter hell. Days, months, and years all blurred into one long-suffering nightmare, and for a time, they accepted that this was all that was left for the rest of their lives. Elena spent most of her time reading the English book that the man left for them to use as toilet paper. She started learning English from the book, and there were times when Mokov would leave magazines and newspapers for them. This gave her the chance to do the crossword puzzles, and after some time, she was able to make crossword puzzles of her own. Katya, on the other hand, turned her attention to painting. She made a series of paintings that became her emotional outlet and a clear reflection of her state of mind. They were exceptionally good and focused on the female body. 
There were mostly windows and nature, because she desperately wanted to see the world outside the bunker. After some time, the consequences of their repeated harm became inevitable. From the very beginning, Elena was scared of conceiving because the man threw any precautions out the window. She begged him for anything to prevent it, but her concerns were brushed aside. Because of this, Elena eventually became pregnant. For Katya, this was a blessing in disguise. She knew that there was no way Elena could give birth inside the bunker. Unfortunately, it didn't turn out the way she had hoped. Upon learning of her pregnancy, Mokov brought them a book on childbirth. It was a manual for medical students. Katya was tasked with studying it, and he told Elena that her companion would be her nurse and midwife. On November 6, 2001, Elena gave birth to a healthy baby boy. Katya was terrified, but she didn't need to help Elena too much because the baby was fortunately delivered quickly and without complications. Katya told Elena that the baby was beautiful, but the new mother felt differently. She begged Katya not to show her the baby and to take him away. After a couple of months, their captor took her son away and left him by the entrance of a multi-level apartment. After the trauma of giving birth, Elena was only given a short recovery time before the man started his daily harm to her again. He continued to refuse her pleas for protection, so Elena became pregnant for the second time. She gave birth inside the bunker on June 6, 2003, to another baby boy. This time, she decided to keep him. Unfortunately, after four months inside the bunker, her son became ill. They saw the baby's illness as a chance for rescue. Even after two years in captivity, they still hoped to escape the clutches of their captor. And so, the two women convinced Mokov to take his son to a doctor. Before he took the baby away, Katya and Elena left notes and messages hidden inside the baby's clothing. They hoped that at least one of the hidden notes would make it out. Unfortunately, their captor changed the baby's clothes before leaving him in front of a house in Skopin. After their plan didn't work, they thought of another way. Over time, they had convinced their captor that they would stop resisting him. This made him relax, and by the time the two women had been living under the bunker for two and a half years, the man began trusting Katya, and she was finally allowed to come out of the bunker. It was the first time she looked up and saw the sky instead of concrete. She took her first breath of fresh air in years. It was spring, and the sudden burst of green was a wonderful surprise for her eyes after the gray world of the bunker. Time passed, and by early 2003, Katya was slowly being allowed outside the bunker more. Mokov even trusted her enough with a particular task. The man was becoming unsatisfied with his captives, so he wanted another. He set his eyes on the medical student who was renting one of the rooms of his house. With this, Mokov tasked Katya to pretend to be his niece and help him seduce the student. Katya and Elena saw this as their chance to escape. They wrote a small note that contained their names, addresses, where they were being held captive, and the date they went missing. Most importantly, the note contained a plea for help. Then, when Katya went with her captor to the student's room, she secretly passed the note to the other woman. Thankfully, the student contacted the police and told them about her strange landlord. It didn't take the police long to realize that the women who wrote the note were Katya and Elena from Ryazan, who had gone missing four years before. The girl said that sometimes, in the evening or sometimes late at night, she had seen how the man would go down to the garden, to the garage or a cellar beneath it, near the house, and she'd seen him bring one or two girls up from there. On May 4, 2004, the police officers rushed into the Skopin residence of Viktor Mokov, which he shared with his mother. Katya and Elena, who was eight months pregnant at the time, were finally rescued and returned to their families. When my parents got there, my mom ran to me, and I ran to her. Well, as much as I could, of course, I could hardly walk, actually. I think I still had bedroom slippers on. Katya and Elena held on tight to their families, and in their minds they considered the 4th of May as their new birthday. It was the start of their new life. 
they were determined to make each day count outside the bunker. Mokov's arrest came as a shock to the people around him, especially his co-workers. Ivan Bobilov and Valentina Shishkina were among Mokov's workmates and close friends who swore there was nothing suspicious about the man they thought they knew. When we heard about it, we didn't really believe it. And it wasn't like him at all. We still don't believe it, really. Is he guilty? Sure he's guilty. But knowing his best side, it's so hard to believe. But Mokov's mother, Elisa Mokov, was most surprised because she lived in the same residence where Katya and Elena were being held. Her son's dastardly crimes were being committed right beneath her nose. He graduated from college. He was an educated man. How did he do such a stupid thing? He doesn't even smoke. Furthermore, it was also revealed that Katya and Elena weren't Mokov's only victims. His first known crime was in December 1999, when a student and her boyfriend visited him at home. Mokov gave the couple alcohol, and when they were both inebriated, the predator began to make his advances toward the female student. He was rejected, and the student ran to the street. Mokov chased her down and hit her on the head. When she lost consciousness, the man dragged her back into his bunker and used her. He kept her inside the bunker for two weeks, but she managed to escape. The only reason Mokov wasn't in prison for this crime was that the student was too afraid to press charges. She feared that Mokov would come after her and end her life. Viktor Mokov went on trial for his crimes, and he tried to paint his image in the best possible light. With Katya and Elena present in court, Mokov tried to convince everyone that he treated his captives well. He even tried talking to Katya, who was hiding behind her mother because she didn't want to see the man who stole years of her life. Katya, didn't I feed you? Didn't I bring you strawberries? Didn't I bring you cake? Can you imagine the parents were there and he said that? The court didn't buy into Mokov's pleas, and he was sentenced to 17 years imprisonment in Siberia. His female accomplice, Yelena Badukina, who pretended to be the man named Leosha at the time the women were taken, was sentenced to five and a half years for aiding in their abductions. After Mokov was sent to the penal colony of Siberia, his victims tried to regain the lost years that they spent in captivity. Sadly, Elena's third pregnancy ended with a stillborn, but her first two sons were adopted into happy families. Mokov was then released from prison after serving his time on March 3, 2021. He then went on an interview in an attempt to justify his crimes. However, his interview wasn't taken well as people refused to listen to the man's excuses for his horrible crimes. The man then continued to have troubles with the authorities, even helping a friend hide the body of someone he murdered. This placed Mokov in prison again in August 2022, though he was released in February 2023. Thankfully, his victims began to rebuild their lives and move on as survivors. They were offered free psychological therapy to aid in their recovery, but after being prescribed medicines that could make them sleep, both refused the sessions. Instead, they began healing in their own way. I did have one meeting with a psychologist, and after that I said no to such help. We were offered it and it was free, but I refused. Today, both Elena and Katya have gotten married and are living their lives the best they could. Katya even published a book in 2021 titled Undefeated to shed light on the darkness of her four-year captivity. I can't say I'm a victim of this. I didn't feel like that, even when I really was a victim. You should never say you're a victim. You should never allow yourself to be a victim. I don't feel sorry for myself, but for that Katya, who was there. I've always believed in myself, and it was that belief that's helped me. I knew that in a year, or maybe two, I'd be an ordinary normal person again. Whatever awful things happen in life, you have to move on. Otherwise, life is just pointless. We don't live for the bad times, but for the good times that life gives us. So, we need to live, learn, work, rest, and do whatever life lets us do. Otherwise, we don't live, we just exist. And I don't want to just exist. I want to live. 
subscribe to watch more videos like this. Turn on notifications and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.